Um, I'm just going to give an introduction for a few minutes and hopefully some uh, some people will be joining. Um, so I'm giving a series this series of three talks on some different aspects of health which I've seen really change um, over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, 1980, I actually got into uh, complementary medicine, macrobiotics, shiatsu, etc. And I've really seen some big changes happen over the last 40 years since um, at the age of 24 I became, started becoming uh, aware of health and life and social, social phenomena. Um, um, I just want to check, just need to check something. Yep. And so I've seen big changes in, in health uh, in three particular areas. You know, one is in the digestive system. Um, 40 years ago, of course, some people had digestive system problems, but nothing like on the scale that people uh, have today. A couple of weeks ago, I was with some uh, some uh, macrobiotic, uh, some other macrobiotic teachers, some friends, going into a restaurant. Uh, I think it was a vegetarian or a vegan restaurant, and um, every item on the menu had a list of possible things which people might be allergic to afterwards: gluten, peanuts, um, um, etc. Uh, Forty years ago, there was very little in the way of uh, allergies to gluten and, uh, and other things. Um, and now, in a lot of restaurants, they're having to make long lists of uh, all, the, all the different ingredients because so, such a large proportion of people have uh, food allergies. So something, something really going wrong there. Another, another area I see that has really changed is a lot of people suffering from chronic fatigue from low energy problems. Um, uh, even young people, you know, even you know, the, the time when we should <coughs> normally have uh, the most energy um, between the ages of um, you know, late teens uh, in our 20s, um, I've seen an increasing number of people at that time, you know, at that age, uh, suffering from chronic fatigue, just you know, very low debilitating uh, levels of energy. So again, very you know weird. You know why is why is this happening when people should be at the peak of their energy? And then the third the third um, um, area I've seen really change is a, a big increase in the amount of what's often called mental illness. Although really a lot of that is more emotional illness. Um, um, and Again, it's always been around and always will be, um, but there's been such a big increase uh, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And schools and people looking after young people are having to, <clears throat> universities having to make a lot of provisions for, to much higher levels of, of emotional and mental illness. So these are, the, these are the three areas that I want to talk about tonight uh, and on the, on the next two nights. So tonight it's talking about the digestive system. Um, <clears throat> this is digestive system is just so central um, to the working of the whole body um, um, because this is where we take in food, we take in energy, and then that it supplies energy to the rest of the body. And if um, if you've ever had a kind of stomach upset, um, you'll know that when when things aren't right in your intestine. It affects the way we feel through our whole body. To start off with, we might have symptoms like bloating and pain and discomfort or constipation, diarrhea uh, in our abdomens. Um, um, but it really affects the, the rest of us as well. We may feel we're probably going to feel low energy. Um, uh, we may feel mentally foggy because when things aren't working here, then things don't work here either. And also, we in the middle here, we may well feel uh, depressed, you know, kind of down, hopeless, um, thinking rather negatively. Um, so, you know, and these are the kind of typical symptoms of any kind of intestinal problem, you know, whether a mild, short-lived one or a, or a deeper one. Um, you know, symptoms in the abdomen, but also uh, they affect us very much emotionally. They affect our energy levels. 
uh, really reduce our energy levels and also um, um, reduce our capacity to think clearly. Um, so they really have big effects on the whole body. Um, so I want to look at what, why, why people's digestive systems have become uh, so much weaker. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, so first of all, this is a picture of a, of a, of a healthy small intestine. So this is looking down the small intestine. Uh, they must have got a camera down there, filled it up with uh, fluid or maybe air, I'm not sure. And you can see these beautiful folds um, um, uh, line uh, going down the intestine. This is in the small intestine. And then you can see that it's kind of furry. Um, the lining of the intestine is actually covered with this little um, uh, little projections called villi which make it look almost furry um, and these little projections are to really increase the surface area of the gut um, so that we can absorb the food much better um, this is a kind of a cute um, picture I found on the internet um, showing um, one of those or a couple of those little villi and you will see that if I can get this, if I can coordinate myself, there is one layer of cells on the outside of the villi, and then inside there are blood vessels and also uh, lymphatic vessels uh, for absorbing our food. So most of the food goes goes from the gut here into the blood vessels, and then the fats go from the gut into the lymphatic system. Um, so this, so the, the 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 coating of the of the villi have to be very thin, because it's got to be able to absorb all these nutrients. Um, but that also creates a problem. It means that that the lining of the intestine is also delicate. Uh, if we go back to this picture, so um, you know, so you know, this look, this is this is soft. It's vulnerable. It's not like it's not like our skin. You know, if we want to make a barrier to the outside, the skin is a nice tough barrier that can keep bacteria and fungi and other things out. But this um, this lining is delicate. And then imagine that uh, we're putting various food down at, uh, in our intestine, and we also have something like half a kilo of uh, bacteria and other microorganisms in our intestines, which are mostly helping us. So. Um, uh, when you stand on the scales, um, look at the scales and how much you weigh, half to even three quarters of a kilo of your weight is bacteria in your intestine. So this, 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 doesn't, this picture doesn't show it because it's been cleaned out so you can see the intestine. Um, if you've had diarrhea or when you have a poo, you, know, you see the stuff that comes out, there's a lot of bacteria in there. So it's just amazing that this lining of the intestine not only is like a thin structure uh, able to absorb all these different nutrients, um, it, it's also got to hold all of these bacteria and viruses and fungi and, and other stuff out. So that's a, that's a tough job that the, the lining of the intestine has to do. So it needs to be thin to let the nutrients through. But it also has to be a good, strong, um, good, strong barrier to everything that's in the intestine. Um, I hope this isn't too graphic, but just imagine, you know, some poo and putting your hand in the poo. Not nice, you know. And that's with a thick, you know, uh, thick skin protecting our body. And then think of this delicate, um, um, you know, lining of the intestine. Not easy to, not easy to keep uh, all these microorganisms out. And I just want to say hi, Christine, uh, hi, uh, Abdul, and, and others who've joined. And if you, uh, if you want to ask questions as I go along, please do, uh, because I can see those come up. And uh, I'm going to give like a bit of a general introduction and then get into some particular uh, problems. So if you have particular uh, intestinal problems, then um, please, please ask. So we've got this, we've got this very uh, delicate lining. Um, that needs to absorb nutrients. I'm just going to show you a couple of kind of horror horror pictures of what can go wrong uh, in the intestine. So this is another photograph down the intestine. Um, you can see completely different. This is with someone who has Crohn's disease. 
a, a really nasty inf uh, inflammatory um, illness in the small intestine. So you can see no villi, just inflamed. You know, you can imagine how painful that is. Um, and no villi, so not a lot of food gets absorbed. So people with Crohn's disease often become uh, really thin and underweight. Um, or you might have heard of celiac disease, where people have a really strong allergy to gluten. And this is someone, that, again, the small intestine um, of someone with uh, celiac disease. And you can see the walls of the intestine, um, but no villi. Uh, again, the lining of the intestine has, has, has been destroyed. So we're not... I'm showing these pictures because we just don't really know what's going on inside of us. And so these pictures make it a bit more a bit more graphic, a bit easier to understand. So let's think about what is really good for really good for our intestines. Uh, what our intestine really likes. And it's been known for ages that one of the things it really likes is fiber. Fiber is indigestible um, matter, uh, which we get particularly in plant foods, which create roughage and they bulk out the food that we eat um, and this helps the food move um, easy, quite easily through the intestines. The intestines to make these peristaltic motions of contract waves of contraction going down which helps move the food through the intestines um, and the fibre provides bulk. Um, it also does a lot of other things. It helps, uh, it helps us maintain a healthy bacterial flora uh, it also slows the absorption of uh, sugar into the bloodstream, um, uh, so it evens out our blood sugar levels. Uh, it also slows down the absorption of cholesterol, and uh, probably lots of other things as well. Recently, it's been shown that people that have that eat more roughage live longer, get less heart disease, get less cancer. So, as you've probably seen in the press, a lot of scientific information coming out now of just how important. Um, what goes on in our gut is. So we need fiber. Um, so we get fiber from plant foods, um, particularly whole grains, beans, uh, vegetables, fruit, seeds, nuts, any kind of whole plant food um, has, um, has a good amount of fiber. In. Um, so obviously what, what our guts don't like is processed foods, which has really been a had a dramatically damaging effect on people's intestines you know, over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Then um, the intestine also likes what you could call slow foods. Uh, we, we've uh, been hearing a lot about fast foods. What the intestines really like is slow foods, that is foods that break down slowly because then there's just a slow release of fats, uh, glucose, amino acids, and so on. And so these are slowly absorbed uh, into the body from those villi into the bloodstream, uh, which then goes to the liver, which then processes these things. And the body can cope. Uh, the blood sugar level kind of rises a bit, but not too much. The uh, fat level rises a bit, but not too much. Uh, and the same with other nutrients. And the body can, can deal with that. And, um, and it's giving nutrition to our body over, over uh, a good number of hours. So what the food doesn't like, uh, what the gut doesn't like is fast food um, because it digests very quickly or in the, in the case of things like sugar, uh, it doesn't need any digestion. Um, um, uh, it can just be absorbed as it is um, virtually. Um, Actually, they're disaccharides, which just need to be cut in half to be absorbed. So there's a little bit of digestion, but it's just so quickly absorbed into the blood. And then the blood sugar level will, will spike. Uh, then the pancreas has to produce a lot of insulin um, um, and to try and bring those blood sugar levels down. And it, and it gives a shock to the body. Um, also, when the blood sugar levels rise, it does, it does a number of other things. Um, um, it, uh, it damages especially uh, uh, very fine uh, blood vessels, capillaries. And people that have diabetes um, not controlled well, um, 
Hi Suzanne, nice to see you. Uh, people that have blood glucose levels which aren't controlled well, i.e. You know, with diabetes, most of the complications they suffer, such as blindness and gangrene in their legs, kidney failure, um, dementia, um, heart problems, are all because of because those high sugar levels uh, uh, destroy fine blood vessels. Um, um, so I was listening. Uh, I think uh, I think it was yesterday. There was a there was a on the food program. Uh, there was a surgeon uh, talking about excess weight, and uh, he was saying how really excess weight has primarily come uh, from processed foods. Um, and there was someone else from the food industry arguing, well, you know, if you have, there's nothing wrong with having a bar of chocolate. Um, and uh, he was making a comparison that you know one cigarette is bad for you, but having one bar of chocolate is is not going to do you any harm. So I would I would dispute that because it's not so much the cocoa, it's it's the amount of sugar that comes in chocolate that will spike your blood sugar level, that is stressing your pancreas. Uh, the body's having to cope with a higher blood sugar level. It's damaging to blood capillaries, um, and also it's been discovered recently. It also um, kind of freezes or inhibits the action of certain white blood cells which are part of the immune system. So your immune system get, is, is kind of diminished for, for something like the next three or four hours. And then if you imagine having a chocolate bar every four hours, then you're really, you're really knocking out your immune system to quite an extent. So even, you know, even, you know, even eating a uh, good sugar dose once, you know, it does have an impact on health. Um, so, so the gut likes slow foods. This is what we used to call whole foods. Uh, when I got into, when I became aware of health and so on, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the thing then was was whole foods. Right now we're into veganism. There's various trends that happen dietary wise. Then it was whole foods. And we went along to the whole food shop and we bought our whole grains, our rice and millet and wheat and our whole beans and bought our whole vegetables etc. Whole seeds, whole nuts. So the body does really well on whole foods. Then a fourth thing which, which the gut really likes is naturally fermented foods. Um, very interesting that if you look around the world at what people traditionally eat, um, um, nearly everybody has something fermented. Uh, sometimes it's fermented grains, sometimes fermented milk, um, uh, fermented mushrooms, usually starchy things. Um, um, just just everywhere, nearly everywhere, people fermented things. And fermented foods really help our digestion because they breed. If they're the right ferment, ferments, they they breed things like lactobacilli, certain kind of bacteria, which are very helpful in our intestine. So also very good to be eating um, regularly, daily, small amounts of things like sauerkraut, vegetable pickles, uh, which are kind of quicker pickles, and also longer pickles. So I've got a jar of miso here, kind of traditional in the Far East. This is a barley miso, and a traditional miso has been fermented for over a year. Oh, it just has such a wonderful smell. It's almost alcoholic. You can just you can smell it. it's really alive. Yeah, really delicious smell. And uh, things like uh, shoyu soy sauce or tamari um, so, uh, soy sauce, again, they've been fermented traditionally for, a, for six months to a year or more. Uh, you don't want cheap um, soy sauce, which is just more of a chemical cocktail. They've bunged in sugar and caramel and salt and other things to, to give the flavor. Uh, you want you want a um, you know a, a properly fermented uh, food. So these are all the things which are really useful for the gut, um, and this is really what people have eaten for ever since the human race was around. We've eaten whole foods, we've eaten slow foods, uh, we've eaten a lot of plant foods. Um, sometimes people have said, well, we used to eat a lot of animal foods in the, in the past, but there's a lot of evidence that actually we're mostly plant food eaters. Uh, one, one very easy way of seeing that is by looking at our teeth. We have nearly all flat teeth up to here, and then we have four canines, and then we have these cutting incisors. So 
if you look at um, if you look at a carnivore's mouth, like such as a cat or a dog, they don't have flat teeth here. They have all sharp teeth, and what the, they they need teeth for cutting through flesh, so that they can then swallow lumps of flesh, uh, which are then digested in the stomach. Amazing, the stomach can do that. If you look at the mouth of a um, uh, hi Pema, hi Alison, thanks for joining. Um, if you look at the mouth of a, a more um, uh, vegetable eater, such as a sheep or a rabbit, they have mostly flat teeth. Everybody has incisors because they at the front because they're useful for cutting, but they have flat teeth. So strange, isn't it? We have flat teeth. Uh, flat teeth are for grinding vegetable foods. Um, um, they're not for cutting through meat. The other thing is, in our mouths, in our saliva, we produce, um, uh, there's an enzyme, uh, amylase, which breaks down starch. So that must have taken, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years to evolve. You know, why are we producing an enzyme in the mouth that breaks down starch? Because we're, we've been, you know, for millions of years, we've been starch eaters. Starch we get from, from, um, from plant foods. Um, so, what our bodies are used to is eating uh, predominantly plant foods, but definitely some animal foods in most areas, um, um, and whole foods, which, you could, which we could call slow foods. Uh, and this is what the intestine does very well. Um, so the last 50 years, what we've seen is the rise of processed foods. Even in the first half of the 20th century, people may have been eating you know, a bit of sugar, some meat, some dairy, you know, some things which we might not consider you know, completely healthy, but they were all real food and people cooked, cooked food. Um, since the 1950s, 1960s, uh, what we've seen is an uh, incredible rise in processed foods. So processed breakfast cereals, processed bread, um, um, processed pastry, processed cakes, you know, every, you know, everything processed sauces and everything. And sugar in nearly everything. Um, and sugar, I think, is one of the most damaging things for the lining of the intestine. So I have a picture here of, um, courtesy of McDonald's, um, of a, uh, a hamburger or beef burger. And what we see, first of all, is we see some bread. Um, but this really is not bread. This is bastardized bread. Um, if you if you just took that bread, you'd be able to crush it into almost nothing because it's mostly air, um, uh, because the fibre and a lot of the goodness has been taken out of it, uh, and it's got sugar in. Um, it's got some white sesame seeds on, rather than whole sesame seeds, so no fibre there. Uh, it's got uh, some beef and cheese, uh, no fibre there. A little bit of lettuce. Okay, well that's okay. That's that, that's good. A little bit of lettuce in there as well. Um, but this, you know, this is, you know, this this is um, not good at all for the intestines. You know, there's very little fibre. There's no whole foods. There's no slow release foods. There's some sugar, which is going to be damaging. And then there's quite a lot of animal food. Maybe small, you know, small amounts of animal food. People can be quite healthy on small amounts of animal food, but a lot of animal food. Um, and no fiber, what happens is those animal foods hang around in the intestine. If we're eating mostly plant foods, we have a, a transit time. A transit time is the amount of time it takes for the food to go from your mouth to coming out the other end. If you're eating mostly plant foods, your transit time is probably something like uh, between 12 and 24 hours. And if you want to, if you want to test your transit time, then Eat some, uh, eat some corn, uh, which is not very digestible if you don't chew it, and then you can watch for when it comes out. People that eat a lot of animal food and not much fiber, their transit time um, uh, is usually well over 24 hours. It's often 48 hours, that's two days, even three, four, five days. And those animal foods are breaking down and um, they're breaking down into poisonous substances such as ammonia, um, which then also damage the lining of the intestine. And this is probably why uh, there's a strong correlation between um, eating a higher meat and animal food diet 
and cancer of the, uh, especially the de descending colon and the rectum, because that's where those foods are hanging around and producing these poisonous substances. So you might have noticed that cat poo or has a very different smell to cow poo. Cow poo, well, you know, you might think it's not a great, a great smell, um, but then there's usually a lot of it. Uh, sheep poo, not much smell. Cat poo, because they're eating mostly meat, has a much stronger smell. That's because there's a lot more uh, ammonia and noxious chemicals uh, in it. So we don't want those hanging around in the gut. Um, so I hope that gives you like a general idea of um, you know, how to look after our intestine. Something else that really has a big, big effect as well is what's happening with, with us uh, emotionally and with stress levels. Um, because actually our whole digestive tract, right from our throat down our esophagus, stomach, duodenum, small intestine, large intestine, is a, mu is a muscular tube. And just like we can develop tension in our muscles, in our shoulders and neck and other parts of the body, we can also develop tension in those uh, internal organs, like the stomach and the intestines. In fact, if we have a lot of tension up here, that goes along with having a lot of tension uh, in our stomach, uh, slightly on the left side, and then in our intestines as well. Um, and obviously, if, if the stomach is tense, then it affects our appetite, it affects our digestion, and the same with the small intestine. And so let's let's do let's do a little exercise. Let's um, let's feel our stomach and our intestines. So find your ribs here, and then in the middle, just a little bit down. Here is your stomach, and then here is your intestines. So you should be able to press in deeply. It helps you lean forwards because then your abdominal muscles relax. You should be able to press in deeply, and it's you know it'd be not painful and really quite flexible pressing a little bit lower down so do try this what you might feel in there it might feel painful and then, and then the large intestine is more out to the sides just inside the hip bones so it might be painful um, because the because the intestine is um, tense or cramped um, uh, and it may and it may feel very hard. It can be. It can feel. Sometimes it feels like there's rocks in there. Small intestine can feel really solid. Um, and a lot of that can be. Can, some of it can be due to our food, um, but a lot of that can be emotional tension as well. Uh, in English, we talk about having butterflies in our stomach when we're nervous, when we're tense. We feel it in our in our stomach. Um, and if we are, if we're having, you know, if we're feeling a lot of emotions, and especially if we're not expressing them, then we often hold them inside, and um, and they make those organs tense, and that really has a big effect on digestion. Uh, it, if there's tension, then the food can't go down easily. Then that can create bloating. It can create wind, and you know, other other problems. Um, so. Um, our food affects the intestines, uh, our emotions can affect our intestines. Also physical exercise really helps the intestines. Because, because the intestines are muscles, they need to move. If we're sitting a lot, then it's more difficult for them to move. When we get up and walk around, our energy is flowing, our legs are moving, and that helps the intestines move, it helps our bowel movements, and you know, etc. So those are the things that um, um, uh, really help our intestine. So really it's just going back to basics, it's doing what we've done for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, eating whole foods, lots of walking, and uh, also good to express our emotions and not hold on to them so that they we release that inner tension. So I hope that's given you a good kind of overview of the intestines. Um, I'm wondering, thank you for those who joined, uh, Hi Bart, Pema, Alison, Suzanne, um, if you've got any questions, um, if there are any particular problems that you're interested in, it would be great if you could type them in. 
Um, um, I'm just so thank you for your little uh, <laughs> symbols and things which are coming up. Um, so I'm not seeing any. I've just got a. I've just. Thank you. <laughs> More symbols. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, check, uh, scrolling down, but I can't see any questions. Any anybody got any questions? Any particular health problems they're interested in in the intestines? If there aren't, then I'm going to run through some some common ones. Um, um, I'm just going to. I just. Wanna, I'm just going to try. Uh, typing in something yeah just to make sure that um, I'm seeing any comments that come through uh -huh. so you're all very quiet tonight um, please do ask questions it's nice when it's more interactive so I'm going to talk about a few different a few different health problems so maybe first um, food intolerances and food allergies um, okay intestinal gas great <laughs> I've got a question um, well I'll get to that um, soon I'll just maybe talk about um, food intolerances and allergies first because as I said at the beginning these these become so common uh, 40 years ago you went into restaurants and um, you know you looked at the menu and you chose what you wanted to eat these days, in many restaurants, they have long lists of all the ingredients, gluten, wheat, duh, you know, peanuts, da 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 because so many people have allergies to foods. Of course, things like food allergies, digestive problems have always been around, but nothing like on the level that they are now. Um, some people blame the wheat. Really, it's not the wheat's fault. It's not the peanut's fault. It's really that um, eating these processed foods, the lining of the intestine, has been compromised, and this um, this thin single line of cells, just one line of cells, um, has to keep, has which has to keep out um, any you know any big proteins, any kind of bacteria and foreign things, becomes weak and becomes leaky, especially sugar, which in Oriental or macrobiotic terms uh, we describe as a yin food. The in foods have a more expansive, can be a weakening, uh, weakened structures. Um, so this this layer becomes too porous, and then things like uh, particularly proteins uh, like gluten and the proteins in peanuts and other foods get into the body. The body feel it's being attacked, and then it sets up uh, an allergic reaction. So there's uh, there's inflammation happens and blood flows in and, and so on. And then you start feeling some digestive pain, and your digestion's not working well. Um, 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 and um, and then we get, you know, and then we we feel unwell altogether. So sometimes this is described as leaky gut. Western medicine has discovered that some people have leaky guts that certain sub bigger bigger molecules that shouldn't get through um, into the villi are, are getting through. Um, they measure them coming out of the pee. Um, so, but they haven't worked out why is it that the that, that those villi become leaky, and it's because that lining of the intestine has been compromised, especially by sugar and a lack of fibre and the other things that we've talked about. Um, so, of course, if one has a gluten allergy or some other kind of food allergy, or food intolerance, which is kind of milder, it's just a food that makes you feel unwell, then we need to avoid that food for a while. But what we also need to do is strengthen the intestine through a whole food, plant-based diet uh, with fermented foods, get our intestine stronger. And then I've seen many people with food allergies and gluten allergies, um, um, three months, six months, nine months down the line, be able to eat those foods in moderation uh, and not get a reaction, uh, which is uh, obviously a good outcome rather than being at the mercy of that food for the, for the rest of their life. Um, um, so, yes, intestinal gas. Um, I guess you need to look at a couple of things. One is, one is what you're eating um, um, to make sure that what you're eating is really digestible. 
eating whole foods, eating eating fiber, uh, really helps. Um, it can help to cook food, even just lightly steaming or blanching, because that makes it it helps start breaking the food down and making it more digestible. Have to always good to check out are there certain foods which particularly trigger uh, the gas? Uh, beans are. Um, uh, most likely uh, culprits because they have certain substances in the skin uh, in order to stop insects eating them um, 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 kind of mildly disruptive uh, molecules so um, if you're going to eat beans some people find red lentils better because they don't, they don't have the skin um, and and naturally processed foods like tofu and tempeh usually are okay um, and if you're going to eat the beans, then they need to be really, it's good to soak them, throw away the soaking water um, um, repeatedly for 24, 36 hours. Um, cook them with some kelp, maybe some bay leaves, some ginger. And towards the end of cooking, add some salt or very nice to add some, some shoyu soy sauce or some tamari soy sauce, which doesn't have wheat in. Um, and then just eat a small amount and see how that is. Some people also have veg uh, problems with the uh, cabbage family, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, etc. can cause uh, wind in some people. Um, so you might, you may need to avoid or just eat small amounts of those foods uh, for a while. And then follow all the other recommendations I've given for improving the health of your gut. Um, and that's going to help. And also sometimes your gut has to learn how to digest different um, uh, different foods so um, it can, there can be kind of learning period with for example if, if one hasn't eaten beans and you start eating beans um, um, okay so I hope that helps a bit um, uh, with your question um, a few other questions um, there was a question about irritable bowel. I think that came through by email, so I'm just going to take a quick look at that. Um, uh, nope, can't see it right now. So uh, it flashed up on my screen and then disappeared. Um, oh, how do you? Know? Okay, there's. Thank you. There's some other questions coming up here. Is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, always related to parasites? No, I think it's. Uh, I think um, it can be, but um, it's really a functional problem. That's why it's called a syn irritable bowel syndrome. Syndrome is a collection of symptoms, and very often in Western medicine they can't find anything wrong. No inflammation or you know, other things going wrong. So it's more of a functional problem where, for example, the intestine is, is cramping, just like uh, we can get cramps in our calves, calf muscles. We can get cramps in our intestine, and that's what produces sharp pains in the intestine when it's cramping. Um, so, um, uh, a poor diet can definitely contribute to that kind of cramping. Also, a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome find that, that when they're particularly stressed or feeling strong emotions, that they get stronger symptoms. So, definitely emotions can, can have an effect as well. Um, how do you know if you have a healthy gut? That's a good question. Um, um, uh, a number of things really. Uh, the, in Chinese medicine, they're very fond of looking at people's poo uh, as a diagnostic method. They didn't have x-rays and stuff, so they looked at what they could do, including people's poo. So they were looking at what they considered ideal, or well-formed, uh, uh, but soft and easily passed stools and the ideal is a golden color golden poo or a light brown color um, if it becomes either darker or greener that's a sign that there's some kind of imbalance going on also having one or maybe two bowel movements a day uh, is, is healthy especially if you're eating a lot of uh, fiber then a lot of people might have two or sometimes even three bowel movements a day because there's a lot more bulk um, um, skipping days shows you're getting a bit constipated is not so great going more often not so great the feeling of you know food digesting easily going down easily 
not getting bloating or um, you know, any any digestive pains. Um, also having good energy and uh, good mental clarity as well. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, when it, you may have experienced when your intestines are troubled, you've got you know, you're constipated or diarrhea or got a bug, it's like you can't think straight and also you don't feel very good either. So when our intestines are good, we tend to feel mentally positive, clear, emotionally positive too. And then thanks for your question about leaky gut. Um, um, and can the villi um, uh, that have been damaged repair? So actually, they they reproduce fast. Um, so they can re if they if they're, if it's if the intestine has a good environment, they can repair really quite quickly. Um, so one needs to do the things which I which I described more at the beginning of you know, eating eating whole foods, eating a plant based diet. Um, something I haven't mentioned so far is chewing your food well. If you have a digestive problem, chewing your food well can really make a difference because our teeth are for break, breaking the food into liquid. So a good oriental principle is um, you chew your food until it's liquid before you swallow it. And you might be surprised how many times you have to chew <laughs> that it takes a little bit longer to eat your meals. Um, uh, when you really chew your food until it's liquid. But that can really make it e easier uh, on the rest of the digestive system. So products and foods to help repair it. I think number one is don't eat anything with sugar in. Even small amounts of sugar can just continue to cause problems. Um, um, and then eating plant-based whole foods, grains, a lot of vegetables um, might be easier to digest having mostly cooked vegetables rather than raw. Um, and those foods, those foods, you know, will will create a good environment and help the intestine to heal. There are a few particular remedies uh, in oriental medicine um, um, which can help um, get more minerals into the intestine, which can have a beneficial effect. Uh, one is a weird thing where you you take some kelp. You can buy dried kelp um, um, in whole food health food shops. Um, you you cook a piece until it's it just covered with water and um, a tablespoon of either shoyu soy sauce or tamari soy sauce and you cook it for about 45 50 minutes until it softens and then you cook all the liquid away and then all of that all of those minerals go into the into the kelp or kombu as it's called in japanese and then you cut it into one inch squares and then you eat two or three pieces of that with every meal and the, the kelp is basically carrying that, the minerals in that shoyu down into the intestines and can help counteract the effect of sugar. It has a more yang effect, it helps the villi create a strong, a strong boundary. Um, um, and uh, Zen Zen, if that's how you pronounce your name, uh, great to see you tomorrow. Also, this uh, this video, tonight's video, it should record, so you can go back and listen to the whole thing um, uh, if you want to. Um, the effects of alcohol on the gut, um, I think not nearly as much as sugar, because alcohol is absorbed really quite fast uh, in the stomach. Um, so in time, it could have quite a big effect on the stomach, but not so much on on the rest of the intestine. Obviously, it depends how much you drink. Um, small amounts maybe could be a good thing because um, traditionally fermented uh, beers uh, made from grains and other fermented, um, um, uh, you know, some forms of alcohol come from a fermentation uh, which may well provide some useful uh, flora as well. Um, so, hi Ellen, Marianne, Sarah, nice, nice to hear you. It's been a long time since we've been in touch. So, uh, does not eating sugar include honey? So, yeah, good question, Pema. So, really, really, there's a there's a there's a spectrum of sugars, and you know, up up the up the extreme end, uh, you've got refined white brown muscovado sugar. Then you've got things like honey, 
um, you know, ca um, cane sugar, um, um, and then you're coming into um, you know, stevia, rice syrup, maple syrup, things like that, and then you're getting into more just sweet vegetables, sweet fruits, you know, things like squash and onions, and um, dried fruits. So there's a range, and um, white sugar or refined sugar is definitely the worst. But even if we eat, you know, a certain amount of things like honey. Um, or maple syrup, or slightly less extreme um, rice syrup or barley malt, if we eat a lot of that, it's still going to have the same effect as sugar. So it's, it's interesting that in traditional societies, people didn't eat a lot, of, a lot of sugary foods. They didn't eat a lot of sweet foods. It's really quite a modern thing to be eating so much um, sweetened food. Um, so... We, of course, we need some sweetness. We can get that from fruits. We can get it from sweet vegetables, and then you know a little bit from desserts and a little bit of sweetener. But we don't really don't want to eat much in the way of honey, rice syrup, etc. Otherwise, if we eat a lot, it really has the same effect as refined sugar. Um, and you're asking about reflux, where we eat food, it goes down in the stomach, and then it comes back up again. Um, uh, in my experience, mostly this this is this is a, in what we call in macrobiotics a yang problem. It's a problem to do with contraction, and it's when people hold a lot of tension in in this part of the body. Uh, they hold a lot of tension often in their liver, and in the stomach, and in the diaphragm. We have this diaphragm muscle which separates the the ribs from the from the abdomen. If you press up under the ribs. So you're pressing on the insides of your ribs. You're pressing against the, the, the edge of the diaphragm. Uh, that can be very a very tense muscle. When there's a lot of tension in this area, then the food can't go down. So instead, it can produce bulging outwards, can produce bloating, or it can come back up again. So in my experience, it's primarily a, a, a tension problem. Um, um, so great, your questions are coming in. I really like questions. So I'm going to uh, I'll, I'll go on answering your questions. Um, I just want to tell you um, uh, while 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 most people are still here, I want to tell you about a course which I'm starting next week, which I've run several times before, an online course, uh, Six Steps to Health, uh, where for six weeks we have a two-hour video conferencing session in the evening. So we for a maximum of 10 people. So 10 people, we can all see each other, we can all talk to each other. And um, I'm talking about, the first one is actually about the digestive system in more depth. And then we go through a lot of other body systems and look at um, how we can be healthy in those areas, what causes problems. And um, I, uh, uh, when people join, I email out a substantial amount of notes, about 140 pages of notes, I think. Uh, including recipes for each section for, uh, for helping uh, digestive system, respiratory system, cardiovascular, etc. Um, if you if you want more information on that, it starts next Monday. It's mostly I think it's five Mondays. It has to be one Tuesday. Um, if you want more information on that, then have a look at um, on the website. Six steps to health. Um, or just message me um, uh, after this and I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, so, Alison, question. Carbs like pasta and rice turn into sugar, so that are they still bad for you? So, um, a good question, because a lot of, there's a lot of people in the last few years saying all carbohydrates are bad for you because they're all turned to sugar. Um, and sugar's bad, and therefore we shouldn't be eating grains or you know, anything high in carbohydrates. Um, but this, this is you know, but this is not true. Eating compl complex carbohydrates, i.e., starch, um, has a completely different effect on the body to eating refined sugar. And so, if we eat refined sugar, uh, I haven't got the graph here. I've got some <laughs> got a nice graph, but on a graph, you eat sugar. The blood sugar level goes up, you know, within minutes, and then that puts a lot of stress on the body. 
If you eat starch, it, it rises pretty slowly over a number of hours and not nearly as high as when you eat sugar. It just rises a little bit um, because that starch goes through the stomach. It's not absorbed in the stomach. Sugar goes into the bloodstream very quickly. Starch is not absorbed in the, st in the stomach. It goes into the small intestine. It needs more enzymes. So it's hours. it takes hours to break it down. So you just get a slight rise in blood sugar, which the body and the pancreas can very easily uh, deal with. So it's fine to eat pasta and rice, but much better if you eat whole ones. You eat brown rice and short grain, long grain, basmati brown, all brown grains. And pasta, get more of a whole mealy one rather than a white one, uh, because white pastas, noodles, etc., again will break down a bit more quickly. So just a little, you know, raises the blood sugar level a little bit more. In general, it's good to your grains to eat a good number of whole grains. So you're eating, you're eating rice, millet, quinoa, buckwheat, barley, uh, wheat, um, um, you know, etc. Plus, you know, maybe some porridge oats, some noodles, some pasta, some bread, and things like that. But really good to eat. You know, mostly, maybe two thirds of your diet, roughly, uh, as whole grains. Um, um, and then they're much more slow release. Um, okay, so an, a, any other questions? Um, otherwise, I think I might uh, finish quite soon. Uh, nice to nice to feel you there, Suzanne. Even though I can't see you, uh, nice to make contact um, uh, and uh, Louisa as well. Um, Anything, anything else you'd like to know about the gut? Um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about bloating because I get a lot of people um, uh, with problems with bloating. So the first thing to find out is where are you getting the bloating? Uh, and actually, why don't we just spend a few minutes getting to know our abdomens? Because amazing how we go to school for 18 years or something, or what is it was 15 years. And mostly we don't know where our internal organs are, which, which is ridiculous. We need to know where our internal organs are. So if we get pain or a problem in our internal organs, we can identify which one it is. So I'm going to give you a very quick lesson in where your internal organs are. And uh, this is one of the best diagrams I've been able to find. So the top of the abdomen is the, the lower ribs. So you need to find your lower ribs and then the bottom are uh, the hip the hip bone and the pubic bone and we're going to find this on ourselves in a minute so on your right side that dark organ is the liver and then here is the stomach tucked underneath it and then oh, this big mass in the middle here this is all your small intestine which then takes the food into your large intestine which comes up the side uh, across the front down this side uh, and then it goes through to the back of the body and to the, and to the rectum and the anus. So let's, let's find these organs. So find your lower ribs. And then on your right side, when you push just straight in, that you're pushing on your liver and the gallbladder is underneath that. Should, you should be able to push in a long way. It feels quite flexible. And then come a bit over to the left side. That's where your stomach is. If you've, if you've had uh, some supper recently, uh, you may be able to feel that. You may feel a bit uncomfortable. You can feel there's food in there. But that's good because it helps you identify your, your, uh, where your stomach is. And then the food comes down into your small intestine. So find your navel. And then all around your navel is the small intestine. All in the center here. This is all your small intestine. So this is where the food really becomes liquid and then um, the, those villi absorb uh, the nutrients. Then the food goes down to the bottom right side and enters the large intestine. So if you find your hip bone and then just inside your hip bone, that's your large intestine, which then comes up here, comes across the front just below the stomach 
quite difficult to feel it there. And then it comes down your left side and again just inside your hip bone. If you find your hip bone, just inside is your large intestine. Um, so if you're getting pains here, then something's happening in your large intestine. If you're getting pains or bloating here, there's something happening in your small intestine. If you're getting pain or bloating up the top, uh, and possibly a bit more to the left side, then but also the stomach comes across the middle, then there's something happening in your stomach. And definitely the most common thing that happens with the stomach is it gets it holds tension. Most people's stomachs are holding a lot of tension. And then the food doesn't go down easily. As I said, with acid reflux, it may come up or it may just cause bloating in this upper abdomen. So that's saying, showing that there's a stomach, the stomach's not happy. If you're getting bloating more down here, then it may well, then it's going to be more of a large intestine or a small intestine problem. Um, so um, it's also very interesting to prod your intestines because it's, it's just amazing how they change from um, day to day and hour to hour. You, know, you have a certain meal and, oh, you know, you. Oh, it's a bit tense here and you can feel something happening here they they they're very kind of responsive and they they really change a lot so do do this um do do check out your abdomen right side liver uh left side and down here the stomach small intestine or large intestine on the sides you know, do, do 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 check them out and just see how they feel uh, and then i also showed you the uh the diaphragm muscle. So coming under the ribs and then seeing if you can press on the inside of the ribs. If you're pressing on the edge of the diaphragm. You should be able to get your fingers right in there. If it's if it's if you can't, it's because it's hard and stiff, which is showing you that your diaphragm is tense. And um, you can do that, you can massage it, you can get it to relax, breathe deeply, do some abdominal breathing and see if you can get your diaphragm relaxed, um, which will also help digestion. Okay, so um, some thanks. Um, uh, kefir, kombucha. Um, fermented. Um, I'm not quite so keen on kombucha because often it's fed with sugar. So... If there's still a little bit of that sugar in the liquid, um, then okay, great, you've got some good microorganisms, but the sugar's not so great. For babies that don't chew well, like one year old, uh, is it recommended to eat whole grains? Um, it really depends how, uh, how old they are. Like if you start giving grains to maybe a sixth, seven, eighth month old, um, it's good to put it through to cook the grain really soft, rice or millet or something, and then put it through a sieve um, 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 or a food mill, which so you're taking some of the fiber out, uh, which just makes it easier to digest. Uh, but, but usually by the time they're one um, or a bit over one, um, they can have the whole grain. It needs to be softer and mushier because, they, like you say, they don't chew. Um, so it needs to be really soft and mushy. So it's good to put it through a food mill, or you can get these little baby food things. You put the food in, and you put a lid on, and then you, you squash it down, and you turn a little wheel, and it squashes up through holes. You need to get it, you need to get it uh, more creamy, um, so that they stand more chance of, uh, so that they can really digest it. Uh, oh, hi John and uh, John and Jan. Why would the stool be? Pasty. I'm not sure what you mean by pasty. Um, not enough water. Um, maybe you can type in what you mean. In oriental medicine, they talk about a diff quite a few different kinds of stools. The most there's rabbit dropping stools, where they're small and hard and often quite painful to come out, um, which definitely is due to too much dryness and heat in the body, and they associate that with liver heat, um, too much heat and from too much tension uh, and blocked energy in the liver. Um, in macrobiotics, we'd say a more yang problem. 
Um, um, then, well, it's maybe it's uh, there's it's maybe um, a, a bit uh, there's a bit more to it than, than than I could go through in a couple of minutes. And not not formed. Um, so something must be happening in the large intestine that because the large intestine does this amazing job. If you've ever had severe diarrhea, you probably know you know you sit on the toilet. Um, hopefully you got to the toilet and it's like water that comes out. So that's that's what the food is like in the small intestine. And then it goes into the large intestine. Um, we produce something like about seven or eight liters of digestive juices a day. Um, so that really dilutes the food. Um, but the body doesn't want to lose seven or eight liters of water. So that water that comes into the large intestine gets absorbed. And the large intestine makes these beautiful stools so we're not losing too much water and other nutrients and we can go once or twice a day, uh, not messy. Um, so if they're not formed, something must be happening in the large intestine. Um, 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 which could be a variety of things. Um, um, the simplest thing would be to just start following the recommendations that I gave at the beginning with more roughage, more plant-based. Um, but it could be a number of different reasons uh, and I'd kind of have to see somebody maybe and hear more about different symptoms to work out exactly what's happening in the large intestine. Okay, well, I really thank you all for, for joining me tonight. Um, tomorrow night I'm going to be talking at 8 o'clock again. Um, I'm going to be talking about chronic low energy problems. So many people these days suffering from low energy. Um, and then on Wednesday night I'm talking about food and consciousness, how our food affects us uh, emotionally and mentally uh, and also spiritually, which I feel is very important. And um, as I said, if, you, if this stimulates your interest and you really want to study in quite a lot more depth, then there's my uh, uh, Six Steps to Health course, online course, which is starting uh, next Monday. And you can find details of that uh, on the website. If you look under Short Courses, um, uh, you'll see Six Steps to Health, or you can just message me after this and I'll, uh, I'll send you a link. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. and. Um, Nice to see some familiar names and I wish you all well and I wish you good digestions and um, if you've got any, any, uh, you know, any other questions you can always email me and if you have any problems then uh, I'm always happy to help with uh, uh, a short chat or, or a consultation which can be on Skype as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.